ago on a Friday yeah. night. So he's he's been he's been real good with helping me out when I call on him. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's been wonderful and helped me out when I call on him. That's good. Yeah. Bishop Grisby, bless you, sir. Bless you, Pastor Jones, brother, and God bless you, men of God. Bless, bless you. you. Good to see you, Doc. Good to see you. Okay, Who's Jones, give five on YouTube, Doc. What's that? Yeah. Live on YouTube. All right. Bless All right. you, sir. Well, we're going to give just about another minute or so for others to join us. I thought I'd seen Joby Jones trying to join us. Uh, we'll give him a, just another minute to get in, and then we'll uh, we'll get right into the chorus. Bless you, uh, Pastor Bruce. Good to see you tonight. Pastor Juan, of course, won't be with us tonight. Him and his leadership are on a retreat. But nevertheless, we thank God for his faithfulness. And then Pastor Paul will see if his network allows him to join from Ghana. Praise the Lord. Glory be to his name. Well, brother, let's go ahead. We're going to go ahead and get started. We know that the brothers are joining us. Thank God for, again, all of you being online with us on tonight. Amen. We're going to open up with song and then we'll have a word of prayer and get right into our course for tonight. I'm excited about this course. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful course really opens the eyes of the believer as to who their enemy uh, truly is. And I'm thankful to God for this course. Uh, amen. Amen. But does anyone have a song on their heart that they would like to sing on tonight? A song that's been uh, resonating in your heart, perhaps all day long. Anyone have a song? Amen. You 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 on mute. You on mute, Doctor Wilson. There you go. I got one, Elder. I got one for you. I got a hot one for you. <laughs> man, man, there you go. I'm gonna lay down my burden down by down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, I'm going to lay down my burdens. Down by, down by the riverside, I won't study the war no more. Well, I ain't going to study war no more. I ain't going to study war no more. I ain't going to study be war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study be war no more. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we bless your holy name tonight. We thank you, O oh God, for leading us down this journey as we grow in your grace and in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for these men, servants, Lord, that have been so faithful, that have given their ears to hear and their hearts to receive with meekness, your engrafted word that is able to save this. So thank you, God, for higher learning. Thank you for the desire to want to know you, Lord, and the power of your word. So bless us again on this last night of this journey. Oh God, let your presence and your power be both seen and felt. Visit our brethren, Lord, that are not with us on tonight. Visit Paul and Ghana and visit and and and, and visit uh, um, uh, brother, pastor, pastor uh, Paul in, in, in Los Angeles, Lord, at the retreat. Be with us tonight, God. Give us wisdom from on high out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Bless you, brother. Wonderful book before us. I'm excited about this course on tonight because 
Uh, this book reminds the church, the body of Christ, the disciple, the believer, that we do have enemies that are designed to attack the body of Christ, the church. So the question is to us all, as we get into uh, our lesson on tonight, what are the three enemies of the church? What are they? Just, just call them out. What are the three enemies of the church? Satan. Satan, amen. Number one, amen. The world. <laughs> the world. And the flesh. And the flesh. Amen. Satan, the world, and the flesh. And I'm excited because this book exposes that to the body. of It reminds the body of Christ that we do have enemies. Go with me, if you would, to chapter one, the beginning, page number five, title of thesis. And we're going to begin reading, and then we're going to explore what the author has to say in regards to our enemies. Look what it says. It says, all the many Christians do not support the belief in a literal spiritual warfare with Satan, the world, and the flesh. Scripture and early church history validates the existence of these three enemies that oppose the church, its mission, and the believer. According to biblical sources, an invisible war is taking place in our universe. This battle happening, this battle happening in the unseen realm is manifested in the physical realm. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 through 18 teaches us that. Our world is a battleground field with good and evil spirits at war with one another. If you believe that, say amen. 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 And since the beginning of time, this spiritual war has affected the human experience. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 19 supports and teaches us that. So for the purpose of this book, spiritual war is anything that stands against opposes or hinders the gospel and the work and witness of God in a believer's life and also in the church. Numerous authors have written about spiritual warfare and have attempted to explain the difficult doctrine concerning Satan and his angels, the world, the flesh, and their influences in the universe. Libraries certain re uh, uh, contain research papers and books with theories or strategies and ideas for spiritual engagement. This book will define spiritual warfare as applied to the world, the flesh, and Satan, three enemies of the believers in Christ. So here we find, beginning at chapter two, God ex ex exposing our enemies. And he identifies as Satan as the first enemy. Look what it says, somebody, in chapter number two. It gives us the identification of Satan. The following references are directed quotes from scripture about Satan. His name in the Greek language means the accuser or the slander. We're talking about Satan. He's also known as one, uh, uh, one that exists that has many demons under him. He is a slander. He is a false accuser. Judas is also called a devil when acting on Satan's behalf. Let's walk through him. He's, he's a liar, full of malice, and a murderer. He is prideful. He is the wicked one. Chapter seven continues to say he's the angel of the of, of the Lord who opposed Balaam. Satan in the Old Testament is synonymous with opposition or uh, adversarial activity. According to First Chronicles chapter 21, Satan tempts David and deceives him in opposing God's word. He's the adversary. Hallelujah. He's the uh, 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 he's the slander of the brother. If you continue, page eight just goes on and on. It teaches us who the devil is. And the Bible names him, calls him out. Judas, he, I mean, he's called the devil, Bezebub, the Lord of flies, of the fly, the wicked one. 
the ruler of this world, the God of this age, Belial. He goes on to talk about how he's the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians chapter two, verse two, and the accuser of the brethren. He is the ruler of the earth. And I like this one. Satan is the chief antichrist of chaos and warfare against God, man, and the angels. So here we find Bible again identifying who Satan is. And my brothers, in our experience, we have witnessed many of these attacks on the church, these attacks on the brethren, these attacks on the body of Christ. Ain't you had, haven't you seen Satan identifying himself through lies and accuser, the wickedness, the rulers of this world? Amen. You can see it from the pulpit sometimes. Am I right? Am I right, Reverend? Mm -hmm. Amen. We see it operating in people, operating in the evilness of this world. But what I'm grateful for is that this book exposes him in scripture. In scripture. So the Bible validates the fact that Satan is an enemy of the church. Old folk used to say in the church, the devil is a lie. Because most people that operate lying often allow the devil to influence them. What are your thoughts on the devil as our number one enemy of the church? Anyone that has a thought? Uh, <clears throat> Pastor Jones, this is very, very powerful. And I thank God for uh, Dr. Wilson following the leading of the Lord and putting that together, putting this together. Because... Uh, I believe that we are all pastoring in a very critical time right now where we're experiencing um, Satan's attacks have intensified against the church. Um, and I think that I, I remember watching G.I. Joe coming up at the end of G.I. Joe, they would always say, because knowing is half the battle. We have to know who the devil, know who our enemy is. Say, our what enemy, you say, Bishop? Amen. Our enemy is not our brother or sister. And this is something I share with the pastors that I oversee. We spent so much time fighting one another, denominations fighting one another. Who's right? Who's wrong? Meanwhile, the enemy is wreaking havoc. If we just came together and just recognized that the real enemy is Satan, we would make a huge difference in our in our community, Fresno period, in our, in, anywhere that we are, if we just Absolutely. came together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you, Bishop. It's very important to know who your enemy is. Oh, man, it's very important because now you know how to uh, uh, deal with the enemy. That's right. To deal with the enemy. And I'm encouraging scripture where Peter the apostle was walking with Jesus, one of his great followers, but yet Peter opposed Jesus. When Jesus began to explain to him that what must happen, that he must be captured and he must die. And Peter began to oppose him and Jesus turned to him and rebuked him and said, Satan, get thee behind thee, amen. Exposing the influence of Satan in, the, in, in, in his own apostle, in his own, his own preacher, his own teacher, and exposes him. And what that does is shows us that, yes, Satan has the, if, if allowed, he would influence even our brothers and sisters. Amen? But I'm also encouraging this book because if you go to uh, uh, um, verse, I mean, uh, if you go to page number 11, because the following section examines two other enemies just as deadly as Satan. They are called the world and the flesh. Good lesson. Chapter number three, page number 11. It exposes the world as our enemy. Look what it says, brothers. That's number two enemy. Scripture in the world and spiritual war. It says the world fallen humanity has a system of beliefs that operates under the God of this world and the direction of its leader, which is Satan. And John chapter 12, verse 31, 
uh, um, affirms that. He leads by deception and destruction and stands against truth, righteousness, godliness, holiness, and the good news of Jesus Christ. In this system of beliefs with human leaders, the governments, there is great opposition to Christianity and to Jesus Christ as Lord. Jesus says that Christians are the light of the world. And that's Matthew chapter number five, verse 14, meaning Christians are the righteousness of God that shines amidst the darkness of this world. Wouldn't you agree that this world and its government system, that is, it is in opposition to the church. It is with this system of the beliefs in opposition to Christianity and to Jesus Christ as Lord. We watched it over the last few years, 10, 20 years or so, how the government's stance has been against the Lord. Every time you turn around, they want to take out the name of Jesus or God out of everything. So it's system of belief, not necessarily the people, because the Lord has Christians in all places, but it's system. The world system is in opposition against the church. Look what it says in paragraph number two. Christ charges believers to be in the world, cosmos, but not of the world, wicked humanity. John chapter 17, verse 14 through 18. Spiritual warfare comes in many forms from the world, through humans, and through the influence of sin and Satan. This is a fallen world that is influenced by an evil spirit who has a strategic plan to oppose all those who love God and are a part of his heavenly kingdom. Ain't that the truth, my brothers? Ain't that the truth how this, this, this world is wicked, it's dark, and, and, and spiritual warfare comes in so many forms from the world. And it's through humans and through the influence of sin and Satan. And this world is an enemy against the body of Christ. In chapter, in, in verse, um, excuse me, in page number 12, second paragraph, look what Jesus says. Jesus states, you belong to the world. Here below, but I've come from above. John chapter eight, verse 23, Jesus was living in the world, but he was separated from its temporal and worldly influence in his own life. World also denotes the condition of human affairs with man alienated from the opposed to God, Jesus wants his followers, here it is, to live in the world, to serve and to witness, but not to be caught up in its godless pleasures and perversities. Brothers, ain't that so powerful? How the God Jesus teaches us, though we're in the world, but not to be a part of the world. In other words, don't behave, act, think, do, and live like worldly people do. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he saved us, he brought us out of the world, out of darkness into his marvelous light. And as disciples, we have to continue to teach that this world and its system, its influence, should not be a part of your life. And my brothers, I'm telling you, you've got to teach it like never before. And I've discovered that, yes, Christians will accept that Satan is their enemy. But a lot of Christians won't agree with you that the world and its system is also your enemy. Because they're, they're, they, they love the world and its system. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of preachers preach that they ought to get what they can from the world. They, they ought to look like the world. They ought to act like the world. They can do what the world does and have done a disjustice to the body of Christ. But if we some holiness preachers, some Bible teaching preachers, some disciple makers, then we must teach that the world is the church's enemy. 
just just shout amen and clap amen if you if you agree with me up in amen. And we can't compromise that. The world is our enemy. And, and so much, look what it says. It, 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 page number 12 it says in the third paragraph, in his high priestly prayer to his father, Jesus requests protection for his disciples. Look what he says. I do not ask you to keep them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. John chapter 17, verse 15. The narrative reveals that the world has two meanings, but one pronunciation, cosmos. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And again, scripture suggests that the world is against both the believer and the rule of God. It rejects Christ, his word, his bride, and uplifts all those who stand in opposition to Christianity. According to scripture, the believer is commanded not to love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But hallelujah, he who does the will of God abides forever. Thank God for uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse, verse uh, 15 through 17. So these scriptures indicate a hostile presence from people who are of the world or who oppose Jesus and the church. These humans are also under the sway or the influence of the evil one who is in battle with Christ and his disciples. Spiritual warfare in the world, that is, the flesh and the devil, are intertwined and these enemies are poised to attack those who are not of this world. The world hates the believer, I'm gonna say it again, the world hates the believer and is at odds with the faith. John chapter 15 verse 18 reminds us that it serves the prince of the power of the air. That's why we see so much of the world looking like the influence of Satan. And we now have been infiltrated or allowed so many different religions who are also a part of the world's influence and they are opposed to Christianity. So the end result is that the Satan is our enemy and the world system is also our enemy. Wouldn't you agree? It's our system. We teach in the church, and I'm sure you teach in your church, and remind the people that they ought not be like the world, act like the world, behave like the world. Matter of fact, people from the world ought to be able to come into the church and see righteousness, holiness, uh, the, the God's word upheld, the truth being taught and preached. But that's a shame, and it's a sad commentary when the people from the world can come into the church and can't recognize whether they're in the world or the church. People acting up, cussing and living any kind of lifestyle, having gossip and negativity and all these uh, 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 influences of the world in the church. Now, now, we're gonna have some worldly folk in the church. We understand that but they ought not be the influence in the church. We're gonna have some that's coming out of the world and they haven't made up their mind if they wanna get saved or not. And they're gonna sit at the back row. They're gonna to try to get involved a little bit. They're gonna even try to come to certain meetings and they have yet to be saved and sanctified, baptized or filled with the Holy Ghost. But the influence, the power of the spirit of God the preaching and the teaching of the word of God ought to display power over any worldly influence that's coming into the church. But we conclude that the world is an enemy of the church. Now, how about that third enemy? Amen. That third enemy is the flesh and 
chapter number four, it reveals, it, it, it exposes, it teaches us about that third enemy. Turn with me to chapter number four, page number 14. I'm going to ask if someone would read the complete page of 14. Pastor Joby Jones, why don't you read page? Oh, we got some. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor Lord, but Lawrence Clingscale. The flesh or the sinful nature discussed in the scripture is often called the fallen nature of man or the spiritual nature. It is also known as that which has been conformed to the world and embraces carnal living and sinful activity and rebellion against God. Galatians 5, 16 through 19. Biblical writers thought of the flesh as weak in that it could not withstand sinful attitudes and behavior. The psalmist saying, in God I put my trust, I will not fear. What can flesh do? Psalms 56. In the New Testament, flesh has the same twofold meaning. The word for flesh in the New Testament is sarex. The apostle Paul spoke of the flesh and beasts, fish, and birds, 1 Corinthians 15, 39. It is considered the skin of the creature, of the created creature, which houses the intellect and the will. And the will. In scripture, the weakness of the flesh was blamed for the disciples' inability to keep watch with Jesus on the eve of his Mark 4, 38. In an even stronger sense, flesh is the earthly part of man re representing lust and desire, Ephesians 2 and 3. According to Paul, the flesh is contrary to the spirit, Galatians 5, 17. It has the ability to war against the new nature of the Christian. Paul, in this narrative, explains how powerful the flesh is, and there is an eternal battle happening inside. Amen. Wouldn't you agree that the <laughs> flesh is at War is an enemy of the church, an enemy of the believer. Amen. It it it, it, it contains the lust. It 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 is the very uh, presence of 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 our flesh and the carnality of it that the devil draw or, or entices. Amen. And tries to influence us to sin against God. And the fact that we're living in the flesh, I once told the church that it is not necessarily your worstest enemy, but it's your closest enemy. Because you're living in the flesh. It's a close enemy. And Paul says, says in uh, uh, page number 15, Paul says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans chapter 8, verse number 8, because the flesh opposes God and it is fallen. Genesis chapter 5, verse 19 through 23 shows the exegetical contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Those two are at odds and war, not sometime, but all the time, continuously. My brothers, we have to teach disciples that your flesh is an enemy. And for those of us that would keep it real and be honest with ourselves and with the church, isn't it true that the flesh, if it goes unchecked, if it goes un, unsuppressed, if it goes, uh, um, if, if it's allowed it to have its way, it will lead you down the path of sin. So anything that will lead you to sin is an enemy of the church, enemy of the body of Christ. Any influence that leads you to sin is an enemy. God bless you, Pastor Paul. I'll greet you tonight. And, and, and so we continue to teach that. Look what it says in paragraph number two, page 15. The flesh in and of itself is not completely condemned for Christ was described as being in the flesh. That's uh, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. Christ alone is salvation, since the works of the law cannot justify the flesh. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, the spirit is able to tame the flesh, control its pulses, crucify its desires, 
and control its nature. But the spirit must be stronger than its foe. Ain't that good news? That even though we have and we're living in that flesh and we have such, yet God has given us power to tame the flesh. Ain't that good news? I'm going to get there later. We're going to talk about uh, uh, um, even though we're ex uh, uh, exposed to these enemies, can we defeat all three? Amen. But Paul, again, Amen. continues in many of his epistles to teach the body of Christ, the, the, the church, all disciples, that your flesh is an enemy. And we cannot, if you will, we cannot be ignorant to that. We must teach that. The Apostle Paul believed in an internal war for the believer. According to Paul, there is a war that is evident in the Christian, the works of the flesh, the old nature fighting against the new nature. And this brings on an internal spiritual war in the heart that is not satanic, that is not a satanic possession, but is the work of the sin nature of man, which is vowed toward the God of this world, Satan. And my brothers and sisters, or brothers rather, excuse me, never forget that when you're teaching and preaching. Never forget that. Never, never, never cease to teach that. That your flesh is at war with the, with the Holy Spirit. And that's very important, especially for the young believer, for the young disciple, because they will be confused when they give their life to Jesus and are baptized, but yet still got to deal with the fleshly desires. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me ask a question. What advice do we give to the young believer who has perhaps given their life to Jesus Christ, been baptized, and is now faithful in the church, but yet struggling with its flesh? What advice should we as disciples, as preacher pastors, what advice do we give that blood? How do they deal with the flesh? Anyone, what advice do, should we give them? I know it's one, one, I, for me, it was uh, self-denial. You got to deny yourself, man. It's a, it's a day-to-day -day thing, right? You got to stay in the presence of God, you got to have uh, wise people around you that you can call on and pray with you and and certain people. Maybe you got to cut away certain people, certain individuals, certain places, right? Yeah. So those, those are some of my, some of my things with them. I know the biggest one is denying yourself because I know, <laughs> right, for me. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Anyone else? My first one is prayer. Hallelujah. Um, because if they develop a prayer life and they learn how to face things head on in prayer and then confess while in prayer because God already knows our thoughts and our hearts. And so I try to teach most of the young men and young women that are college students and working on adulthood that when that temptation arrives, the first thing you can do is pray. But be honest in your prayer to God yes. and tell God, he already knows what it is, but he loves to hear us say it. That's where confession comes in. And in first time, he tells us if we confess, yes. he's faithful and just. And so none of us are perfect, but we can overcome daily when we learn to have a prayer life. Yes. And yes. learn how to pray in the moment of crisis yes. instead of allowing the flesh to run rapid. Amen. Amen. Prayer life. Anyone else? Anyone else? Um, I, I, I tell them just to be real. Um, to understand that even though all of us are saved, and me included, that we all have a testimony of Paul where we have some type of thorn. Everybody has something that they're fighting. And so we teach them that 
the struggle is real, but you have to choose. And we choose, we're here today because we choose freedom. The struggle is real, but we choose to live for the Lord. And so we tell them that the struggle is going to be real, but you have to choose which side. We can't choose for you. Joshua said, choose ye this day. Every man has the right to choose, and they have to choose what they're going to do. And so that's what we tell them. Amen. Amen. Hebrew hey, professor, I, had, I, I lean toward trying to teach them the scripture. Yeah what the Bible says about the battle and the war and how the scripture is the sword of the spirit. Yes. And the battle and for the flesh, it takes place in the mind. And so being able to use the scripture to fight back, everything everybody else said is true. So Absolutely. I just add that scripture piece to that too as well. And it'll help them because like you said, uh, the battle is nonstop, mm -hmm. it's continual. Mm -hmm battle with the flesh and I argue I think the flesh is the worst yeah. of the three Ooh. it's vicious man it's non-stop man it, I, it's I the closest it wakes you're right it wakes up with you yeah you, 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 you yes. I, I've shown a few of them uh some of my guys Romans 7 14 through and they be like man that's what I'm going through right yeah. <laughs> right that, yeah Romans yeah, yeah. You, you, you know what, in addition to all that we said, I teach them how to find the scripture that's tailored to what they're going through, right. tailored to what you're dealing with, and, and memorize that scripture. Every time that temptation arises, quote the scripture, right. because you're only going to be able to overcome temptation with scripture. Right. I teach them how to pray. And I'm going to tell you another one. They'd be like, fasting? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. deny yourself. There's some, some things that are only going to happen through fasting and praying. Right. <laughs> deny yourself. Learn how to start now. Learn how to practice fasting now. And those mm. are some of the things we teach. And I know you teach them as well. Get in the Bible study. Get in that word. Every time the church or the do doors of the church open, be there. Get into that word. But one thing I've discovered uh, from Bible study, from, from the word of God, is that before sin comes temptation. Yeah. And the Bible mm. teaches us that we are, we are tempted when we are drawn away mm -hmm. after our own lust and enticed. Mm -hmm. But I'm so glad that we don't have to sin. Right. For the Bible said, for there's, there's no such temptation that is known unto me. But the Bible said, but God is faithful, yeah. would allow us not to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. And with the temptation would allow a way of escape. So there's always an opportunity when temptation arises for you to say no. Yeah. Amen. Not sometime, but all the time. God will not leave us weak and unprotected. We can say no. And when you and I, when I've taught that. People say, oh, I got the power. Yeah, you got the power. Holy Ghost power. Mm -hmm. You can say no to the things in which the Lord has saved you from. You just got to say it. You got to speak it. And that becomes very important. Very important. And we have to teach that. Because if we teach anything else, you set them up for failure. You set them up for failure. True. Now let's let's move into a, another uh, a chapter five, if you will, that's going to show us how the early church in history and the spiritual warfare they had to go through. Because the Bible teaches us that the early church battled these enemies. So it's not just saying we do it; the church been battling these enemies from the beginning of time. The church been battling the enemies in the end time. Page number 18, turn with me if you would, because 18 through 20, it teaches us the spiritual warfare towards the men of the gospel, the leadership, the church. And man, I was blessed just to be reminded of all the men or many of the men who were martyred, who were attacked, who were persecuted by the enemy. Look what it says. Events in the church history show that demonstrations of God's power often lead someone to believe. 
but they also excite the enemy, the world and Satan to greater opposition leading to persecution and death. In the book of Acts, persecution, imprisonment, and death were given to those who did great works for Christ on earth. The reality of persecution as spiritual warfare is the perspective that this is recorded in biblical history and came to the first century church. Satan being the God of this age was able to use this system to persecute believers of the church. Christianity suffered great persecution from the world during this time period. And according to scripture, the followers of Jesus and the early church fathers endured spiritual warfare with the world. Satan, the prince and power of the air, convinced men that Christianity was evil and that it must be silenced on earth. And you would find that evidence in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse number 12. Look, the first church martyr was Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, verse 57 through 58, he was stoned to death, not because of his his, his, his intellect, not because of his possessions, but because of his faith. Judaism tried to destroy the works of the church. World religion was at war with Christianity. And since that day, world governments and religions have attempted to wipe out the gospel. The second mark, it goes on, of the church was James, the son of Zebedee, the elder brother of John and relative of the Lord. His Mortem took place 10 years after the death of Stephen. And oh man, this book is blessed because it goes on to talk about another martyr of the church and, and, and victim of spiritual warfare was Philip the apostle. According to the scripture, he was born in Bethsaida, Galilee and was the first disciple. He labored diligently in the upper Asia and suffered martyrdom at, uh, uh, at uh, Helopius in Phrygia. Phrygia, excuse me, he was scourged, thrown in the prison, and afterwards crucified AD, around AD 54. Because of his faith in Christ, he was executed in spiritual warfare. And my brethren, on and on, we see how many men that were persecuted because of the enemy. Satan had his hands in it. The world and its government system had its hands in it. The flesh had its hands in it. And as you read throughout the course of this book, you would see many others, Matthew and many others, Peter and many others that were persecuted because of the church. Give me an ex I'm persecuted because of the enemy of the church. I want to show you this, though, because I like what, I like what the lesson teaches us. In page number 19, the last paragraph, look what it said. All men that follow Jesus were subject to death and persecution because of their faith. There was warfare against the church, yet those Christ called followed him into battle. And how many of you believe that that steel? is the same today. Mm -hmm. I was in seminar in Jackson, Mississippi, and a preacher came in to teach class. And at Mississippi, we're in seminar, we get to go to every year, and there's normally about 100, 150 men from all over the country, Africa, and the other places. And we come together as a part of our leadership, uh, our leadership conference. And he said, and he was speaking on spiritual warfare. Bishop Claude Alexander, I believe it was. And he was speaking on spiritual warfare. And he said, at some point when you have a church and you are the pastor, the leader, the shepherd of that church, you got to make up your mind what kind of church you want to be. He said, either, oh, I'm sorry, what kind of ship you want to be. He said, either you're going to be a cruise ship or a battleship. He said, either you and we, you, you're going to be a cruise ship in which you're going to be the helm of the ship. You're going to be the captain and everybody going to relax, do what they want to do. Pleasure over here, pleasure over there, enjoying themselves. Uh, only a few do the work. Everybody else is lounging, gambling late night, 
doing what they want to do, just having a pleasurable time, or you're going to be a battleship where everybody, when the enemy shows itself, everybody man their battle stations. Everybody's a soldier that's on the boat. And he said, you got to make up your mind what kind of church you're going to be, a cruise ship or a battleship. Woo, Reverend, I came back to Bethel Church. And man, I called them all out. Man, we, 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 we going to be a battleship up in here. And if you ain't prepared to fight, you might as well jump ship now. Mm -hmm. Because when Satan, the world or the flesh arrives in here, we're going to oppose it with the word and the, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I never forgot that. And I've, and, I, and, I've, and I've taught and trained and developed men and women at Bethel Church to be just that. That's good. Amen, man. somebody. That's good. And early church battled. They battled Satan. They battled the world. And, and here, you, even if you look, it continues on. It talks about Andrew, the younger brother, Peter, the gospel of Mark, Matthias, and many others that were persecuted yeah. from the enemy. And it goes on and on. But I want to go here because I know time is, 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 is running out. Let's go to page number 24. Well, you again, you talk about spiritual warfare and the opposition of the church. And we end on this page. And believe me, I encourage you, read, completely read the book. Read it twice, perhaps three times. It'll bless your life. Chapter 6, Spiritual Warfare and the Opposition of the Church. Look what it says. Scripture affirms that Satan continues to use the sin nature. For an example, Jesus warns Peter that Satan demanded permission to sift him like wheat. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Peter later warns believers to be sober, spirit, and to be on alert. Your, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion, seeking someone or whomever he devours. You see, Jesus taught Peter yeah. what Satan looked like, <laughs> who he was, and how he desired to sift him like we. And now Peter, as a good disciple, began to teach us and the church yeah. that that same Satan same desires Satan. to have them. That's discipleship making at its best. Sit down. And as leaders, we are to do the same. We know what Satan looks like. We know what the world looks like. We know how the challenge is our flesh is. Coming up yeah. as pastors, preachers, we can testify that it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time you get in the pulpit, somebody want to get on your nerves. Mm -hmm. Argument want to happen here. Mm -hmm. Somebody want to stress you out. People coming into your pastor study lying on somebody else. <laughs> saying they saw them at the club last night. Yeah. And then when you say, are you willing to put that in writing? Oh, no, pastor. I just want you to know. <laughs> right. 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 And so forth and so forth. We see it. We've experienced it. So thank God that we can now teach and remind them that the, the devil, the world, and the flesh is our enemy. Mm -hmm. any, in, 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 any thoughts? My God. My God. My because my God. one thing we got to be reminded. That even though we are, even though our enemy is exposed and we know who they are, can I ask the question? Yeah. Can we defeat all three enemies? Yes. Yes. Ain't that good news to know that God, that Jesus didn't leave us powerless. That's right. God told us who they are yeah. and then he teaches us that we can defeat them. And then he gives us the blueprint on how to do it. Over in the book of Ephesians, chapter number six, it teaches us to put on the whole armor of God. Sir. 
that you might be able to, to defend yourself, to fight to, against the wiles of the devil. Amen, that, somebody. Yeah. That explains, man, why we have so much opposition. So much yeah. opposition from just doing what God called you to do. That's it. <laughs> Just, just that because you're doing what he say do. Yeah, that explains why I'm catching what I'm catching, Doc. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm yes. trying to hold back now. That's right. That's and right. It explains, it explains why so many, we see so many brothers fall and quit. Ain't that something? Yeah. And we, 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 we see it because the, the opposition, it proves itself daily. It proves itself daily. Man, the devil don't care if you're a preacher. Yeah. Matter of fact, he 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 he's gonna attack you even more because he knows that you have a great following and that if he can cut off the head per se, the body gonna fall. So yeah. we got to be on guard every day. We got to put on the whole armor of God every day. Amen. He don't care if you how long you've been married. Temptation, the flesh would attract you to something that you remembered in high school. Am I talking to somebody? The world don't care if you're a preacher. If your credit ain't good enough, they ain't giving you nothing. If 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 you would say oh, I'm a preacher and, and the judge can care less, he's an atheist. He you know, he 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 care less who you are what credentials you have. So we're reminded of that, but aren't you glad that God gives us the tools, the word of God, the know-how, the knowledge, the wisdom on how to defeat our enemies. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged in 1 John chapter five, verse number four, the Bible says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. God, forgive me. Where am I? Here it is. And what's whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believed that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So the Bible teaches us that we have overcome the world. I'm so glad about it. There was a time when I did every, I love money, Bishop, that, to the degree I robbed for it. And if necessary, I would kill for it. Oh, yeah. If it came between me and you and some money, but God, when I fell in love with Jesus, I overcame the world and its possessions and the lust thereof. And if that money ain't mine, it ain't mine. I ain't touching it. Mm -hmm. God delivered me from that. And the flesh. How about the flesh, y'all? Come on, man. And, and I agree with you, Reverend Dr. Wilson. It is one of the most powerful to me in my life because it's so close to me. I wake up in the flesh, meaning in this body. And I have to remind myself to put it to death daily. Mm -hmm. To yeah. crucify. Paul said he crucified his flesh not every now and then. Every day. Not yeah. every quarter. But every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. every day. And the book of Colossians, chapter three, verse number five, the Bible says, therefore, put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetous, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. So we can put your flesh to death. Mm -hmm. But you got to be willing. And we have to teach young disciples that you got to be willing to put your flesh to death. You know, bro, Professor, you said something, man, that's so powerful. I, I, I would just add to that. I can't, I can't, man. I mean, you did, man, thank you. I think one thing we have to teach them, too, is about the consequences. Oh, yes. We don't talk about the consequences Good. of sin. We just warn them about sin. Hey, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I think sometimes we have to show them examples. This is what it looks like. Yeah. When you do this, 
Uh, yeah, I, I've, I'll, learned, I'll, I've learned that some consequences, they can't be reversed. Right. Mm. God can be merciful yes. and he will be merciful, but the effects of that thing are what they are. Right around. Yep. Mm. When a guy, man, loses his credibility in the community, Come on now. he loses his integrity. He may repent and God restores him, but his credibility is still what it is. Yes. Good teaching. Good teaching. And <laughs> man, and that's that warning. That's that, that's that uh, uh that that warning. Say, listen, you you don't want to lose because some things you can't get back. Yep. You can't get back, dog. What? Yeah, you can't get back. You 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 can't do what you want to do on the job and they fire you. Do you say I'm sorry? Right. Oh boy. Hire me back. Oh no, dog, you lost that. Right. Right. And I agree with you. Your integrity, your influence in the church and in the community, your 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 influence as a father, as a husband, as a man, as a leader. So you have to guard and protect yourself. And and I'm gonna tell you, you gotta have a, a spiritual uh, um, um, spiritual mind of warfare. You gotta yeah. know you in the war. Yeah. You gotta know you in the battle. Yeah. You gotta and know all... you fighting the devil. You fighting this world, and you fighting your flesh. You gotta know that at all times. At all times. And that's why the Book of Ephesians teaches Paul to put on the whole armor of God. Yes, sir. And that simply means daily. I heard a pro preacher say, "Man, don't leave the house mm -hmm. without your armor." Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you step out your door, matter of fact, before you get out your door, yeah. the war the war begins. Yeah. So what a wonderful book. What a wonderful course. What a wonderful lesson that teaches us yet again who our enemy is. I'm so glad that this book reminds us of that. Yeah. And my brothers, we got to teach the church, the body of Christ, who our enemies are. Bishop, Bishop Grisby. I wanted to say something, um, there's something that I experienced re recently. Um, I used to, I, when, I, when I hear Reverend Klitschkill uh, talk about his adjusting to Fresno, I always smile uh, because I'm from Fresno and I had to adjust to ministering. <laughs> I had to adjust to ministering out here and I'm from here. Uh, but I was uh, pastoring in, in this area versus just being a member of a church in this area mm -hmm. are two different things. Yeah. Uh, but recently what, what I, what I, I, I went on a fast and the Lord began to, uh, he took me into the book of Daniel to show me uh, a study on territorial demonic spirits uh -huh. and how uh, they take over territories uh -huh. and how when Daniel had prayed, he waited 21 days. And when the angel came to him, he said, I would have came to you sooner, but I was caught up with the Prince of Persia. Sure. There, is, there are regional demonic spirit principalities that have uh, or take dominion or take the uh, power over territories. Yes, and sir. in this area, in Fresno, there is, yes, there's sir. a principality in the, over this area. And if you are so, if you're not, spiritual mind you will allow that principality to block you to stop you to defeat you and not understand what's going on i have to ask i have to ask the lord it seems like i'm i'm exhausted all the time trying to pastor i didn't feel like this before i was pastoring things i was going through things i'm going through now and the lord reminded me he said you're at war yeah you, 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 and then he reminded me of uh, uh, of when Jesus went to gather gatherings and the man that had was devil possessed mm -hmm. and those demons they said okay that's fine that you cast us out of this man but don't let us lose the territory as long as we yeah. can stay here so yeah. we're fighting a territorial demon and it's going to take all of us and, and, and I'm, under, I'm at a place now where I've been preaching unity 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 a house divided Cannot stand. And that's we have to stand together and we will win together if we stand together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you, brother. 
Great I, I, I agree with that. I write about that in my first dissertation about the principalities, right? Yes. See, Satan cannot be omnipresent. That's right. That's right. Everywhere at all times. Yeah, but he right. is highly organized. That's right. And what he's able to do, and that's why Paul breaks it down in Ephesians chapter six, the high, the uh, the hierarchical right. uh, structures. Yeah. Principalities, powers, right? Powers. He breaks it down. He's talking about talking about um, the manner in which. Yes. Satan goes about his warfare. That's right. So if you can look at the world like we look at it in uh, geographical territories or continents, yeah. right? He yeah. has to strategically place these soldiers yes. right. in battle, right? And notice, they work in high places, governments. Yes, yes. So they're responsible for the systems of this world. Mm -hmm. he, he's all, he already has the flesh working in his category, right? So my flesh is already on his side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when he can strategically get engaged in the systems, right, right. and then create havoc, yes. God, we do have to work for him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> the segregation, <laughs> that, that, that segregation, that, 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 That's right. that, 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 uh, um, that spirit of territory. Absolutely, you know, it, 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 and, and and that is so true. Oh, that's so true. Absolutely, and and, and that that divide and conquer attitude Absolutely. and spirit, and and it, don't you know that I I, I I see it even in families. Right, that's right, right, uh -huh. brothers. I it, I'd like you. I go to at least either preaching or attending at least thirty funerals a year. Come on now. I don't know why. That they think that 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 I that they they choose me, but I've had to preach and or participate in at least thirty funerals a year, and you would see that normally, or I would say normally, but oftentimes when somebody died, mama died, papa died, now the family who once went to church together are at war with each other mm -hmm. over the material things of this world. Right, right, right. The devil to get in one, influence the other, and there it go. Mm -hmm. Divide yeah. them and conquer the whole family. They sitting up there mad at each other in the pew. Right. And you would think that they would, they would, they would come together. That's right. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the church, Bishop. I hear you, man. That's right. Mm -hmm. Unity. Man, I don't care what denomination you are from, ethnicity, color, creed. Right. If we fly the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ, we ought to be able to have some church. We ought to be able to worship. We ought to be able to pray. We ought to be able to engage in fellowship, encourage, and support one another. Mm -hmm. so, I'm in no, agreement with you, right. Bishop. You're so right, bro, Professor. Just piggybacking again on Grigsby and his comment about Klingscale's uh, observation about mm -hmm. Fresno. I, you know, that observation can be said any place. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. that those places are difficult because we live in a fallen world. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. He has claim to this world. So there's going to be opposition mm -hmm. wherever you go. Now, granted, I believe, you know, some places are darker than others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that opposition is going to be real. Yes. So, speaking on that, I thought. So when I was first start getting into ministry and stuff, I thought the gates of Hades was a uh, was just a place that he was talking about until I started dealing with Hidden Center. I found out the gates of Hades was real. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? This is a real place. So, so I understand that like, in certain areas where I went to doing a study on it and how that was a gate, but they went the man worship. So we began to have church out of there. You, you, you see what I mean? So I, I see it's a, now the enemy stuff started coming up, missing, and they start breaking in our stuff. So it's like the enemy was mad that we was over there getting people delivered. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened when the boxing, but when we were in there having service, <laughs> lives yeah. being changed, people getting delivered, and the enemy, that's what he was mad about. He yeah. don't care about them kids coming in there fighting. <laughs> but he see, the, the deal was 
he had the church had been removed from that building. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he thought he had gained that territory. What you say? Yeah. And therefore, he you come back saying, "No, we repossessing this territory." Amen. <laughs> and then you 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 face the the battle. Mm -hmm. and, and and that 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 is the biggest part of ministry no matter where you go yeah, I've been I've, I've been to Sacramento Davis Bakersfield Los Angeles no matter where you go you're always going to be met with opposition yeah I think what crushed my spirit the most yeah. was the fellow brothers, Mm. That's supposed to be my brothers within the district, right. within the denominational structure. Mm. They, fa I feel they failed me mm. in giving me the support I needed coming in. Two showed up for my installation service mm. wow. because they were upset that an outsider got sick. And half of them to this day don't really deal with me. Wow. I deal with them out of love and I respect them but let me invite them to come to me and not come mm. but when they invite second we go yeah. because I got better training Amen. that flesh man that yep. flesh I'm telling you that flesh. because they had <laughs> idea of who they wanted at second yes. right. that because of the history of second and the territory because of the territory, yep. they had the idea who they wanted that they thought they could, could get a hold of some of this property and control it. That's that's just carnal. That's that's carnal, uh, uh, and, and and that's ter terrible terrible examples of, of leadership. But I, I do want to say this: I was reminded while I was in prayer and consecration, the Lord said, "This the earth is mine." Mm -hmm. The earth belongs to the Lord first. Yeah. yeah. And even he, even with Canaan, Canaan had already belonged to the people of Israel and they lost it and they had to go back mm -hmm. and regain it. That's so it. God has called us. He's called Reclaimed. his children. He said that he said that the kingdom suffered with violent, but with the violent, we take it. He has given us the power to take back the territory. And that's warfare. We're Absolutely. fighting. A territorial battle. Satan does not want us. He doesn't want us here. Yeah. Anywhere. He doesn't want the gospel yeah. anywhere. But if this gospel be here. Yeah. 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 We, we've got to preach it. <laughs> got to preach it, man. Doc, don't get me excited about eschatology. Don't get me excited. Because <laughs> when he comes, Doc, when he comes, the millennial reign, you're going to see. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. That's right. Right. The army took it back, Doc. The Biden have took it by force. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. right. Hallelujah. Right. Taking Can't be scared, man. Can't be scared. Man, if even when even when the Satan, the flesh, or the world arrives in the church, in the four walls, in the sanctuary, it ain't time for tucking your tail and saying, get them, deacons. You got to stand up over the pulpit, flat footed. Ten toes on the ground, head above your shoulders, and preach the word of God. That's it. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. The, the Bible says Bible. it has been written. Now, oh, man, you got to preach the word. The Bible says be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering yeah. and sound doctrine. That's preach it. the word. That's right. And we have it, brothers. We have the power to preach it. Yeah. And the power to live it. Yeah. I'm excited, man. I'm excited. Yeah, God. Well, any other comments, any other remarks? We are closing out. My brethren, it's been a great journey in this master's program. It's been a great journey in this course. God has blessed us. Amen. You have done wonderful work. Your reflection papers have proven it. And you have done a wonderful work. And certainly God is, is, is going to elevate you in knowledge and understanding. And he's going to allow you to be able to use all that you have learned in your ministry.
Man. It's been a joy and a pleasure to be your facilitator, to be a professor during this course. I thank God for you. We do excuse Pastor Paul. We know that he is um, uh, he is in a leadership retreat, uh, but we thank God for all of you, even our dear brother Wade from Ghana, man. God bless you, my brother. We acknowledge you. We see you. Uh, the challenges of getting online and being a part of us. Bruce has been a blessing in facilitating us as well. And Reverend Wilson, we thank God for your leadership. Amen. The Anglos Biblical Institute as it continues Amen. to teach us and to take us to higher learning. Any other remarks before we close tonight? Um, I just want to find out thing, Professor. Thank you so much for everything. Guys, check your email, okay? You have a chat. A week okay. come back in February for uh, preaching. You, you'll be preaching a chapel uh, service. So look at your calendars. And then I sent you just another copy of your syllabus, the next class that we'll have in February. So you'll see that. And then I think Brother Paul has some words, Pastor Jones. Brother Paul. Brother Paul. First of all, please, I'm um, sorry. I'm not great to have them here. And I want to know um, when, when exactly I will submit my, our, our, our final reflection, please. Yes, I sent you an email, Brother Paul. I sent you an email with your syllabus and uh, chapel okay. information. And then Thank this you, lecture, this lecture is also recorded on YouTube for you as well, so you can go to YouTube and 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 re rewatch it. Thank you, Doctor. So, Doctor, are you, are you starting our reflection on? Um, uh, M -M -M body of text as well as done in the table. What's that? What's that, brother Paul? What's that, Pastor? Yeah, I'm asking whether we are we are supposed to submit some reflection on manner in the chapel and uh, body of text group. Yes, yes, I have received your work on the man in the chapel on the Monday night. Yes, sir. So you have your final paper that's uh, due a culmination of all 10 chapters, five pages, 10 pages rather. Man on the chapel, man in the chapel. I'll send it to you, I'll email it to you. And excuse me, brothers, I've been saying, I've been saying Pastor Paul was on a retreat. I mean to say Pastor Juan, amen. He's on a retreat. On tonight, mm -hmm. I've been saying Pastor Paul, amen, it's, 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 Pastor Juan is on the retreat with some other leaders in his church, but he has sent all his work in. Uh, uh, he sends his greetings and love to all of us and, and reminds us that he would love to be here with us as he is every Thursday. But again, he's in a pastoral 